fighters who in their last ring appearances decided matters with crisp right hands. But for the heavyweight, it came in round one. While for the junior welterweight, the climax waited until two seconds before the final bell. City, New Jersey, Julio Cesar Chavez and Mike Tyson, live on HBO. We are live as Trump Plaza plays host from the convention center in Atlantic City, New Jersey. And HBO Sports presents World Championship Boxing. In our first fight, two belt junior welterweight champion Julio Cesar Chavez defends his title against number one contender Kyung Duk Han of Korea. The bout is scheduled for 12 rounds. Then in the main event, former heavyweight champion Mike Tyson takes on Alex Stewart. That fight scheduled for 10 rounds. The Atlantic City Convention Center, the expansive indoor arena which has been the site in the past of two of Mike Tyson's most memorable and explosive knockouts. In the summer of 1988, Michael Spinks went down in 91 seconds. A little more than a year later, Carl The Truth Williams was knocked out in 93 seconds. Now the former champion returns, and as a swirl of backroom politics rolled this sport into another bizarre chapter in its history, we take you to this 20-foot square ring, the only place where prize fights are won and lost. The night, Mike Tyson and a potentially tough opponent in Alex Stewart take matters into their own hands. And hello again, everybody. I'm Jim Lampley. We welcome you back on HBO to the continuation of Mike Tyson's quest to regain the heavyweight championship he lost in February of this year to Buster Douglas in Tokyo. Working with me, as always, is HBO's boxing analyst, Larry Merchant, the noted sports journalist. And Larry, since his loss in Tokyo and his victory over Henry Tillman, Mike Tyson has had to endure the sight of watching the man who took his title away not just beaten, but thoroughly humiliated by the new champion, Evander Holyfield. What effect, if any, do you think that has on Tyson? Well, practically the effect is he's going to have to wait at least six months longer to get a shot at the title, which has him seriously aggravated. And who knows what that'll lead to by next September or October. What I'm curious about is whether the swoon that Buster Douglas took in that fight somehow diminishes Tyson even farther with his fans. It shouldn't, because he didn't lose to that Buster, Buster Douglas. He lost to the Buster Douglas who got in shape and was highly motivated. He lost to Mr. Hyde, not Dr. Jekyll. What's at stake now for Mike tonight in a fight that almost everyone expects him to win easily against Alex Stewart? Well, I think what's at stake here is for him to start to try to restore his sense of invulnerability and invincibility, which Douglas just demolished in Tokyo. And to do it against a young, strong heavyweight who was considered a legitimate opponent or perhaps a legitimate victim. Alex Stewart's mission is to try to exploit that new sense of vulnerability that people see in Tyson. That's what makes a fight. So indeed, in our main event later this evening, we'll continue to chronicle the Tyson career as we have for the past four years. But first, you're going to get another look here on HBO at the man regarded by many as pound for pound the number one fighter in the sport. Two belt, 140 pound champion Julio Cesar Chavez. And had it not been for Douglas's memorable upset of Tyson in February, surely the most talked about fight in 1990 would have been the March epic battle between Chavez and Meldrick Taylor. Here now, a look back at the sweet science of that unforgettable fight, with narration lifted from the words of the incomparable boxing scribe A.J. Liebling. The Sweet Science by A.J. Liebling. The sweet science is joined onto the past like a man's arm to his shoulder. There's something about the approach of a good fight that renders the spirit insensitive to annoyance. 
Some champions are more skillful than others. And every now and then, one comes along who feels he can beat the title holder in the class above him. He is the current IBF Junior Welterweight Champion of the World. WBC Super Lightweight Champion of the World, Julio Cesar Chavez. I'm so excited I could watch these guys fight for three straight days. I see the right hand of Taylor, he's dropping. Yep, and Chavez is throwing over the top of Taylor now, beginning to land with more consistency. Right hand leads, doing the damage for Chavez now. A solid left inside. Hitting at such short range, the boxer leaves a correspondingly brief opening. The trick is to take the initiative by anticipating the opening, or by moving the other fellow off balance. Having done that, one fighter sometimes can land a whole series of blows before the other breaks into the rhythm. It's incumbent on Taylor not to give Chavez an unnecessary chance to get back into this. Look at the speed of Meldrick Taylor's flurry. He's carried out George Benton's game plan to perfection. Whoa, you Trading punches inside, and Chavez again seems to wobble slightly as Taylor lands at will. Brilliant stuff from Melvin Taylor. Chavez on the verge of going down. He's on the fence, and he needed him now. No. He needed his hand. No. The fight is hanging on this round here, Mel. This is the fence, Sam. This is the last and final round. Man, go on, dude. No. Nobody called you. Man, go on, dude. No. You want to be tempted? The fighter must be confirmed in the belief that he can lick anybody in the world and at the same time be restrained from testing this belief on a subject too advanced for his attainments. Well, Julio Cesar Chavez must begin to contemplate the reality that he's got three minutes in which to produce an unlikely knockout where he will see his streak end before thousands of his countrymen. Punch was the antithesis of a roundhouse. It was a model of pugilistic concision. No referee should take it upon himself to gamble on a man's recuperative powers. If he gets up, he probably wins the fight. fight contains within itself the seeds of its own abrupt termination, a possibility of which the members of the fancy are well aware, but which they push back into a neutral corner of their unconscious when they set out for the scene of the return match. We bring you back live to ringside, and we must point out that some of the drama Attached to that knockout with two seconds remaining in the fight stemmed from the fact that it preserved one of the longest unbeaten streaks at the beginning of a career in the entire history of the sport. You can see that Chavez is third on that list with his 70 consecutive wins. The two fighters ahead of him <clears throat> fought before the turn of the century and within the decade after the turn of the century. Chavez, one of a handful of unbeaten champions in the sport today, unbeaten and untied, and the one with far and away the greatest number of fights. We credit him with 70 victories. There are some who credit him with as many as 72 or 73 victories, record-keeping a bit uneven in Mexico, where most of his fights have taken place. And this is Ken Duck on, who gave us a bit of a thrill this afternoon by almost becoming Ken Duck off. He was threatening not to go through with the fight in a dispute over money with promoter Don King. It was later resolved at the insistence of New Jersey Boxing Commissioner Larry Hazard in Ahn's favor. As you can see, he readies for his first championship fight. Kyung Duk Ahn from the Jinju province of South Korea is 29 years old. He has been boxing for seven years as a professional. This will be his first fight on this side of the Pacific Ocean. He saw the Taylor Chavez bout and told us he was more impressed with Meldrick Taylor. Korean fighters typically are very strong, very determined, well-conditioned, but lacking in world-class boxing skills. 
Kyung Dugan has had 30 bouts, 29 wins. The one loss took place a few years back. 13 knockouts and 29 wins is indicative of suspect power. Maybe not the kind of punching power he would need to put up a stiff battle against Julio Cesar Chavez. He has the facial structure of somebody who can take punishment, but he hasn't faced anyone nearly of the caliber of the man he's in with tonight. He told us he believes this is a bit of a crossroads fight for all Korean fighters, because he's acutely aware that those fighters have mostly shown courage and not technique when fighting in the USA. And here now is Chavez entering with what is becoming a larger and larger entourage with each passing assignment. A remarkable fighter and athlete. All those qualities that I ascribed to Korean fighters he has, and much more, including many skills. And just look at that, his last fight exactly a month ago. And that's one of the reasons he's been able to sustain himself on top, because he keeps active, stays in shape, never has to go out of his way to get in shape for a fight. He sees it as his responsibility to an adoring boxing public in Mexico to make himself available there to fight. And he has had four assignments since the Meldrick Taylor bout. In this Me man is extraordinary in every way. In Mexico, he was very highly regarded before the Taylor fight, but there were arguments among the cognoscenti of whether he was good as some other outstanding Mexican fighters. But after the drama of his victory over Taylor, uh, he went up a notch, he says, and now so much is expected of him. Another look at the record, and we remind you that we at HBO are relatively conservative in crediting Chavez with 70 wins. There are others who give him as many as 72 or 73, but for us, it looks like this. 70 and 0, no draws, 60 knockouts. Tale of the tape. And you will see that there is little difference between the two, an inch height advantage for on. They weighed in at the same weight, one pound under the limit. The reach is identical at 71 inches. And here are our punch stat numbers, which give you a profile of how active these fighters are. Of course, it's very difficult to assess these, given the difference in the caliber of opposition they have faced. New Jersey rules for the bout. Three judges will score it on the 10-point must. No standing eight count, no three knockdown rule, and a fighter cannot be saved by the bell in any round, including the 12th, a New Jersey rule. Right now, let's go up to the ring announcer, Michael Buffer, for the pre-fight introductions. Ladies and gentlemen, good evening and welcome to Atlantic City's Convention Hall by way of Donald Trump's Trump Plaza Hotel and Casino here on the boardwalk in Atlantic City, New Jersey. This bout is approved by the New Jersey State Athletic Control Board. Boxing Commissioner here in the Garden State is Larry Hazard Sr. The Chairman, Jerry Gormley. Board members, Gary Shaw and Richard Harrison. Deputy Commissioners are Lawrence Wallace and R. Yogi Hiltner. Chief Physician of Ringside is Dr. Frank P. Dog, and also in attendance, Dr. Earl Shaw and Dr. Paul Williams. This bout is also sanctioned by the World Boxing Council, President Jose Suleiman and Ringside Supervisor Gabriel Peña Garricano. The IBF is also sanctioning this bout, President Robert W. Lee and Supervisor Ringside Marion Muhammad. Alternate referee Tony Orlando counting for the knockdown seconds and a timekeeper is Roosevelt Gilbert. The three judges assigned at ringside for this bout. First of all, from Puerto Rico, Angel Guzman. From Switzerland, Oranz Marti. And from the United States, Frank Brunette. And now, ladies and gentlemen, Don King Productions, in association with the Trump Plaza, presents 12 rounds of boxing for the WBC Super Lightweight and IBF Junior Welterweight Championships. The referee for this bout, working for the 72nd time in a world title match, is Tony Perez. Introducing first, fighting out of the blue corner, 
wearing the red trunks with red letters. He weighs an even 139 pounds from Jinju, South Korea. His professional record an outstanding one, 29 victories, 13 by KO, only one defeat. He's the number one ranked challenger in the world. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome Kyung Da And his opponent fighting out of the red corner, wearing the red trunks with black trim. He also weighs an even 139 pounds. From Culiacan, Mexico, an outstanding professional record. 70 consecutive victories without a loss or a tie. 60 victories by KO. Ladies and gentlemen, let's welcome the WBC super lightweight and IBF junior welterweight champion of the world, Julio Cesar Chavez. This is Meldrick Taylor country, so that was a very nice reception. Julio Cesar, and I've just given you the instructions already in the dressing room. Alguna pregunta? Any questions? Shake hands, and good luck to both of you. Shake hands. Kyung Dugan told us that his fight plan would be to allow Chavez to set the pace in the first couple of rounds, find out what it is Chavez does, and then hope to extend the bout and make it a long one. slow starter who builds momentum from the second and third rounds onward. He likes to start out by finding opportunities to go to the body, particularly with the vicious left hook. Maybe the best left hook to the body in boxing. That was a straight left on the rib cage. First effective punch from on. moment on appears to be a little cuter than we're used to seeing in the, the many Korean challengers who have come to America. Those jabs are being blocked by Chavez who has both gloves up in front of his face. And there's the first left hook to the body. It might have been a little low. tries a left hook to the body. Nice combination, four punch combination, one of them landed. Boxing is so popular in Korea that ultimately we should find a real world-class champion in one of the bigger divisions from there. Many Korean boxers did well at the 88 Olympics in Seoul. Although, of course, many of us will just remember the one Korean boxer who sat down in the ring for about an hour after the fight. There's another outstanding combination from Kyung Duk An, Larry. Four punches, the last two of which connected solidly. He seems to be warming up a little bit. Chavez has his eyes fixed on a spot below Ahn's Adam app, Adam's apple. As he continues to look for opportunities to the body. And as we go to the corners between rounds, interpreters in both corners. Ruben Castillo, former two-time world champion, will bring us the information from Chavez's corner and Ron Lee 
who has helped us in the past with Korean fighters, will do so in Ahn's corner. Throw your jab more. Move. Move him back and forth. Throw your jab, your left hook to the body, and throw that combination. Come on, keep your mind straight. Keep your mind straight. You did it right. You did it right. Watch out. Watch out for his right jabs. The uninitiated viewer might be a little startled to see that Ahn was credited by Punchstat with landing only seven blows in round one. But as we mentioned, many of his punches were blocked by Chavez on the gloves. Okay, okay, that finished Meldrick Taylor. Certainly not thrown with the violent intent that it was thrown with when Taylor went down. That did not appear to be the kind of punch that would put a championship class fighter on his back. Unless it was a harder punch than he's ever been hit before. He told us he had never been down before. He's about to go down again. Job is landing with lefts and rights, and Ahn searches out a place to fall down. Now he looks to his corner for guidance. Six, seven, eight. I think he was cowering on the ropes there after a body shot hurt him, Jim. Remember, there is no three knockdown rule in effect, so it's conceivable that Ahn could go down again and continue fighting. And Chavez looks like he wants to get this over with quickly. try to keep Chavez busy. This could be a long minute for Kyung Duk on. Good right hand by on and another one. Both landing flush on Chavez's face. This is a very game kit. Well, he's going to find out that Chavez has one of the great chins in the business. He's not backing off, trying to defend himself with offense. Landed another right hand at long range, and there's a left, and another left. Chavez digs a hook to the body, and that stops on for just a moment. All in all, a pretty courageous show by Kyung Dugan, who has been down twice in the round, but has rallied. Another left hook to the body, and Chavez gets in a right hand in the closing seconds of round number two. Okay, let's take a look at this now. First, that straight right hand, which I think stunned more than hurt on. There you see it again. Well, he landed it right on the point of the chin. And here's knockdown number two. And you're gonna see on searching out some canvas. And smartly. 
He bought some time. You know, Chavez is absolutely obsessed with getting a rematch with Meldrick Taylor, and he kidded with us yesterday that he was going to make this a long fight and maybe not look so great to entice Taylor into a rematch quickly. But I don't think that uh, he's looking to make this a long one, and the kid is not cooperating with him. And while we were listening to the action in Ahn's corner between rounds, in Chavez's corner, he was being told to move side to side, not stray right in front of Ahn, because Ahn could still be dangerous. Now Ahn crouches back toward the floor again, and Chavez is momentarily confused. Might have been looking for Tony Perez to stop it. In the opening 20 seconds of this round, they traded blows in the center of the ring with on giving just as good as he was getting. Both hooks to the body, slightly low, but Tony Perez is in a position where he couldn't see exactly where they landed. All three of those punches were a little below the border. But Perez, as you said, was on the opposite side of Chavez and didn't see that. And Ahn isn't complaining anyway. What good would it do him? There's another low left hook to the body. More than halfway through round three, and Ahn is beginning to slow down. He's not fighting back now quite as vigorously as was the case in the final minute of round two. And you have to believe that the body punches are taking their toll. Down he goes. And half the crowd has gotten excited over some kind of ruckus that's happening behind us. Jim, that's what you were hearing before that knockdown. Han cannot go on and he retires. Or as we say in America, he quits. Nobility and courage took Kyung Duk on only so far. Probably a lot of people in the arena expected that to happen somewhere in the middle of round two. It finally takes place at two minutes, 14 seconds of round number three. So Julio Cesar Chavez has the 71st win of his career, his easiest win ever here on HBO in about more typical of the kinds of fights he gets when he goes down to Mexico to entertain his fans there than of those we've seen here in the United States. Let's take a look back now at the action from round three, which led to Ahn's retirement, prompted by the third knockdown of the bout. The trademark left hook to the body, a combination, and on was down in his own corner. And though we could not hear it from here, since he went down in his own corner, it's entirely possible that his handlers, through the ropes, suggested that this would be enough. He was able to get up well before the count of 10. There it is, digging the hook to the body, and you can see on putting his right arm down to try to protect himself there making it easy for Chavez to land the one-two combination that finished things off. Ladies and gentlemen, the official time, two minutes, 14 seconds of the third round. Referee Tony Perez stops this contest. The winner by TKO, still undefeated, still champion, Julio Cesar Chavez. It was the appetizer. A lot of people here were excited about the chance to see Chavez on the same night that they will later get to see Mike Tyson in the ring. The two have been compared so frequently in recent years in terms of their overall proficiency. As many thought before Tyson's loss in Tokyo that he was the best pound-for-pound -pound fighter in the world, an honor that most accord to Chavez at this moment. Total punches in the bite, or in the bout, I should say. As computed by HBO Punch Stat, Chavez landing half of his blows and many of them punishing blows. And we go now to Larry Merchant in the ring with the winner and interpreter Ruben Castillo. Julio, congratulations. Was he a little tougher than you thought? Sí, era más peligroso que pensabas. 
Eh, realmente yo no pensé que fuera tan, a resultar la pelea tan, tan fácil, la verdad. Eh, lo único que puedo decir es que me sentí muy fuerte. Y ser igual. Three, siete rounds. He was, he was letting him come at him so he could hit him, so he could last six or seven rounds. Well, after you knocked him down twice in the second round, he jumped up and he started... Va a ponerse agresivo y nunca te lastimó en cualquier momento. No, la verdad no, lo estaba dejando que, que me llegara porque yo sabía que la pelea iba a terminar muy rápido. He said he was, he was letting him come at him more because he knew that the fight was going to end. Let's talk about the future, Leo. Yesterday when we talked, all you wanted to talk about was a rematch with Meldrick Taylor. What are your thoughts on that? When do you think you'll get to fight him? Hablando de tu futuro, ayer todo lo que hablaste era de Meldrick Taylor. ¿Cuándo es la pelea con la revancha y qué son tus pensamientos de eso? Yo quisiera que la pelea se hiciera lo más pronto que, que, se, que se pueda para demostrarle a todo el mundo a Meldrick Taylor y al que, se, y al que esté, esté enfrente conmigo que yo soy el que soy mejor que ellos. He wants the fight to happen as soon as possible. He wants to demonstrate to everybody in the world that he's the best fighter and he wants to he wants a rematch. Ya se lo demostré una vez noqueándolo, ahora quiero pelear de nuevamente con él para para que no he, haya controversias. He's already demonstrated the first time I knocked him out, but he wants to do it again so he can make sure there's no there's no controversy. Are you disappointed that Taylor is going to try to win the welterweight championship next month? and that you would then have to fight him for a welterweight championship should he win. Si, si, si eres desolucionado porque Meldrick Taylor quiere pelear por otro, camp otro campeonato, ¿qué es lo que piensa? Yo pienso que Meldrick Taylor no tiene ningún derecho a pelear por el campeonato welter. He says he doesn't think that Meldrick Taylor has any reason to fight whatsoever for another title first. Tiene que ganarme a mí primeramente para poder esperar un título del mundo. He should beat him first before he can fight another Absolutely. title for title. But if he does win the welterweight championship, will you fight him as a welterweight? Si gana ese campeonato, el campeonato de peso welter, pelea, pelearás con él no en peso welter? No voy a pelear con él, no. No, never. never. All right, congratulations again, but we have the start of a negotiation going on here, how he will eventually fight. Meldrick Taylor. Back to you, Jim. Thank you, Larry. And as you alluded to, before we see Chavez against Meldrick Taylor again, we will see Taylor here on HBO on January 19 as he moves up in weight class to take on WBA World Welterweight titleist Aaron Davis. That fight will take place here in Atlantic City also, January 19 here on HBO. Let's move on toward the next subject of the evening. If you're a boxing fan, and you've been reading your newspapers, you're well aware there is again turmoil in the heavyweight division. To shed a ray of light on that volatile subject, we're going to revisit now some of the issues at hand and hear from some of the heavyweight principles. In the eyes of the boxing public, Evander Holyfield now rules as undisputed heavyweight champion. But will the World Boxing Council strip its belt away? To understand that question, you must first go back to last February in Tokyo. Buster Douglas went down in the eighth round and was granted a long count. At least that's the view of Tyson's promoter, Don King. Immediately after the fight, King registered his protest against this so-called injustice. Everybody has seen the facts, and the facts are irrefutable and incontrovertible. Now chaos ensued. The IBF immediately backed Douglas as heavyweight champion, but the WBA and WBC withheld their recognition until a public backlash forced those two sanctioning organizations to establish Buster Douglas as undisputed heavyweight king. Back in New York, Don King and Mike Tyson eventually followed suit. There's never been a question from our side as to who the heavyweight champion of the world was. And I respect the fact that the new, the new champion won the title. But the only thing I'm saying, I wasn't trying, I wouldn't want the title on a change decision, you know what I mean? You win the title in the ring, you lose it in the ring, I believe. I'm just saying that Mike's not going on the deep end, he's not discouraged. The only thing I asked for is just a rematch, that's all. Simple as that. Once I get a rematch, I'll take care of everything from there. That's all I'm asking for as a champion. A rematch that wasn't to be. Buster Douglas gave the first shot to number one contender Evander Holyfield. 
who ironically had waited more than a year for his opportunity. Don King, meanwhile, had collected letters from all three organizations, stipulating that the victorious Evander Holyfield would have to fight Mike Tyson in his first defense. But Holyfield, his promoter Dan Duva, and manager Shelley Finkel had already signed Big George Foreman for April 19th. You're watching a man who has been known to knock opponents out with glancing blows. His hands are so heavy that what becomes a knockout punch doesn't always look like one, and Rodriguez goes down. When the Holyfield Foreman fight was announced, both the WBA and IBF recanted their earlier mandates, but the WBC still hadn't sanctioned the fight. All championships are won and lost in the ring. Nobody can take away from Evander Holyfield what he won in that ring, except the man to my right, George Foreman. Jose Suleiman may weigh as much as him, but he can't take it away from him. Only George Foreman can. But as far as uh, the WBC is concerned, it's based on that phony argument in Tokyo that somehow Tyson was deprived of, a of, the, of his just due. Somehow Buster Douglas didn't knock him out. Somehow something occurred there what the rest of the world didn't see. It's a phony argument, and we don't want to give it any more credence we don't, we don't think it deserves any, and as far as we're concerned, this is the undisputed heavyweight champion of the world. The winner of this fight will be the undisputed champion until somebody's able to beat him. Dan Duba went to court in New Jersey and was granted an injunction forbidding the WBC from stripping Holyfield. Jose Suleiman and the WBC countered with a request to have the entire matter sent to binding arbitration, both parties agreeing to abide by the decision, Duba and Holyfield, have since accepted that offer. And as for Mike Tyson, he now sits and waits for the winner of Holyfield and Foreman. Or if the WBC does indeed strip Holyfield, there's talk of a Tyson fight with Razor Ruddock of Canada for the WBC crown. Stay tuned for the continuing saga of backroom boxing politics at their most familiar. And we bring you back live to ringside where there is news on the heavyweight front today. Earlier we spoke to Holyfield's co-manager Shelley Finkel, who told us that WBC chief Jose Suleiman, in a bit of a surprise, had given to him, Finkel, to hold for Holyfield the WBC heavyweight championship belt. He gave it to him today. Finkel said he didn't place much importance on that, but he did say that he's totally confident arbitration will go in Holyfield's favor. What do you make of Suleiman handing over the belt to uh, Shelley Finkel today? I have no idea. What can you say about Jose Suleiman, who tells people still that he thinks that Mike Tyson beat Buster Douglas in Tokyo? This is all really unfortunate for Tyson, I think, because it gives the appearance that he's still trying to win outside the ring what he lost inside the ring. Mike Tyson should stay active, stay in shape. His turn is coming. So what would the reaction of the boxing public be if, in fact, Suleiman and the WBC were to strip Holyfield of that title and set up a championship bout between Tyson and Razor Ruddock. Well, it would be declared another in a long series of black eyes on boxing, and I don't think the public would, in the end, accept that as a championship fight. All right, let's turn our attention now to the main event of the evening, the 40th professional bout of Mike Tyson's heavyweight career. Let's get ready now for a look at Mike Tyson against Alex Stewart. Nineteen ninety has been a difficult year for Mike Tyson. February 10, Buster Douglas knocks him out. The aura of invincibility is shattered. June 16, the one bright spot. A first-round knockout of a suspect opponent. August 30th, Tyson takes 48 stitches over his right eye after a butt in sparring. The scheduled September 22 date with Alex Stewart is postponed. On October 25, the fallen champion is forced to sit by as his conqueror is disgraced by the new heavyweight champion, Evander Holyfield. And now December 8th, Mike Tyson finally faces Alex Stewart. Will we now see the old fire of the champion whose power and hand speed ripped through the heavyweight ranks? And he's down again and in serious trouble. Well, he's, that's, just a That's not 
shot. This time they took the goal shot. A beautiful it's shot. Steele and seen enough. Or will this able opponent throw Tyson's career into a dramatic tailspin? Tonight, Mike Tyson's year comes to a close, and we get the answers to those questions. We bring you back live to the convention center in Atlantic City, New Jersey, as HBO Sports presents the main event. Former heavyweight champion Mike Tyson takes on top contender Alex Stewart. The fight is scheduled for 10 rounds. So now, with aspirations of fighting the winner of Holyfield and Foreman, Mike Tyson again takes center stage in this ancient facility. The night before a sellout crowd, Tyson faces a potentially tough test on his comeback trail. There may be no title on the line, but Mike Tyson provides an electric jolt to a fight crowd, a unique one. There's nothing quite like the feeling at ringside as you await the opening bell of a Mike Tyson heavyweight fight. And as I mentioned to you earlier in the broadcast, we at HBO Sports have covered Mike Tyson for the past four years, bringing you every one of his fights since before he won the heavyweight championship. We believe we have profiled him and reported on him in virtually every way, shape, and form possible through a relationship which has not always been completely, completely friendly. In fact, we're in the middle of a period right now in which things are not all peaches and cream between our longtime colleague Mike Tyson and those of us at HBO. So with an eye toward that, we decided to look for fresh eyes and ears, an independent perspective on Tyson as we get ready for this look at him. And we have acquired the services of America's most provocative filmmaker, award-winning Spike Lee, who came to Atlantic City and went to Brooklyn also with a 35-millimeter film camera to produce a profile of Mike Tyson for us. Spike, thanks very much for doing this. Welcome to our broadcast. Glad what was here. your perspective and your intention as you began this project for us? Well, what we wanted to do was just record what Mike and Don had to say. I felt that they would be very comfortable with us knowing me that they would let their defenses down because a lot of times you have to be careful what the media's or how the media's can betray them and we just want to document that uh and we just let we just rolled the camera that's what we did we shot in 35 millimeter black and white and we approached it as if we were making a film you have said publicly that you regard yourself as a friend and a fan of mike tyson's right is this journalism or advocacy it's both i'm not gonna lie uh i think that mike and don have got pummeled in the press a lot and if I could help them you know the not really change their image I think that there are a lot of people look at this piece and still not like them but uh I think that they have to make up their own minds we're going to talk to Spike again after you have seen what you're about to see but we want to make this clear that this was Spike's baby we interfered in no way shape or form after we gave Spike the chance to bring a 35 millimeter camera here and to Brooklyn for this profile of Mike Tyson I'm not afraid of anything. I'm not afraid of anything. There's nothing that I'm afraid of, you know what I mean? And that's why I'm the individual that I am. You know what I mean? I used to I walk it like I talk it. Um, from where I came from, I'm not supposed to even have made it. I'm not supposed, supposed to even to be, be living. Hey, my name is Victor Nelson. So what's up? Ain't nothing. Uh, well, I live right here in um, 178, and I knew Mike for about um, 12 years. And grew up together. And, you what know, name is this? This is Brownsville, and boy. Yeah, he had to knock that punch all ever since he was young. You ever seen him knock some money out on the street? Yeah, I used to have him knock people out for me. Yeah? Yeah. But now he's getting paid to knock people out. That's good for him. I like that. Hey, my brother. <laughs> Let's do the right thing. That's all yes. How's Mike? How's Mike look? Mike looks excellent. He's in good shape. Good frame of mind. If you don't stand for something, you don't. They don't live for nothing. So he's you know? ready, right? He's been ready. Been a shot. He knocked out three sparring partners all in one day. Been hurt now. Oh man, it changed him. Like you know, going in and out like a slot machine. What Joe Lewis said, you can run but you can't hide. So all we gotta do is bring the bring the prophecy to those words to reality. Ali got me into boxing. 
I was in Sparfit, like, um, that's a juvenile on a place in the Bronx. Right. And Ali came up there. And when I saw him, I said, I want to be champ of the world. I want to be just like him. Everyone can't be um, Michael Jordan, a uh, world heavyweight champion, all that. Or else, you know what I mean? A brain surgeon, which probably I could be, though. But, you know, you could be a brain surgeon. <laughs> I could spike, man. Every ethnic group takes pride in their heroes. We have no heroes. Our heroes die. White heroes never die. They live infinitely. You know, the John Waynes and the different things, but Marvin Gaye, one of the superheroes of our time, you don't hear about him, but Elvis Presley has earned more money in death than most niggas can earn in life. Mike Tyson is our hero. He's our knight in shining armor. When he strikes a blow, he strikes a blow for all those who are, uh, are, are, are discriminated against, all those who are segregated against, all those who are the downtrodden, the underprivileged, and denied. He fights like a gladiator like our white brothers can appreciate. This guy comes to fight. He comes naked with his shoes on. He's a gladiator. He signifies what he's about. Now, I don't blame Holyfield and Buster Douglas for hating him, because I was taught to hate Don King when I was in the business. Everything, everything's totally against us. We're two black guys from the ghetto, and we're hustling, and they don't like what we're saying, you know what I mean? It's not, we're not like prejudiced, anti-white. We're just pro-black. I love white people. I love them like they love me. Here you have a young man named Mike Tyson, who has been a very credible a champion, a credible challenger, and now is waiting his turn again. What they're trying to do is to get a groundswell of public opinion to avert and circumvent ever fighting Mike Tyson. They want him, number one, to either defect from me, because he's, he's being represented by a black man, or number two, they want him to get frustrated and exas exasperated so that he will self-destruct. They always change the rules when black folks come into success. Black success is unacceptable. They say, oh, things are getting so much better for you. In 1849, it was hitting blacks on the head 100 times a day. In 1990, they hit them 48 times a day. Isn't it better? Oh, it's got to be better. You're, you're, you're saved 52 blows. You got to understand that white America has an uncanny way of making the victim the victimizer. Excuse me, master, for putting my head in the way of your club. Not that your club is brutalizing my head and putting hickeys on it. My head got in the way of your free swing and broke your shiny stick, and I want to apologize for that. Wait, 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 cut this for a minute. The way people um, portray me in the press, those guys, if they had the nerve, they'd be just like me. They're superstars and regardless of their fields, they want to be able to say, you know what I mean, the white man's kicking my ass, you know what I mean? But they don't got the guts, you know what I mean? The reason they don't got the guts is because their minds have been suppressed. You know what I mean? Like most fighters in general, when you think about the issue, they're whores to the system. They don't know. They have no concept or what's going on in the business. The only thing they know is put on gloves. Most fighters wind up going to wind up broke, and that's something that's going to continue to happen as long as the game is here, because boxing is the only sport that's unorganized. You know what I mean? You don't have to be a college professor, you know what I mean? Guys, lawyers, you know what I mean, get out of their field. They retire from their field, the law field, and come into boxing, because they feel that's the easy way they can make a dollar, because they can pimp the fighters. Just speak up, Mike. We hear you. Talking. <laughs> we're gonna play this game for basketball today, okay? Right. Most of you are not to play this better than me, so we're gonna try to do something. What you want me to dunk on you, mommy? You ain't talking no boy. I know you would box, man. Do what you can do. Do it. Do. If I got to play, you want me to do? What you want me to do? together works. Well, you and I together, undeniable is a combination that's unbeatable. I love it when Jews love the Jews. I think that's noble. Italians love Italians, when Irish love Irish. But when a nigga loves a nigga, it's an unpardonable sin. We can't be white. You're a nigga till you die. If you're a poor nigga, you're a poor nigga. If you're a rich nigga, you're a rich nigga. But you never stop being a nigga. And if you get to be educated, you're just an educated nigga. You understand? <laughs> the private, poverty, ignorance, lecherousness, lewdness, evil, everything that was negative and unholy was attributed to the black people, and everything that was holy and glor glorified was attributed to the white people. The money, the wealth, the power, and with the blacks is the powerlessness that we have to be able to deal with against the power. You got to understand that negative associations coupled with blackness is what make these things happen. 
It's been a condition of racism since this country was founded 400 years ago. Because working together works. <laughs> Go ahead. And I refuse, you know what I mean, to be like the rest of the brothers, you know what I mean? They evaluate their success by how far they can get away from the other niggas. They say, well, ooh, I live in Beverly Hills, there's a number of white people around my neighborhood, so I know I'm successful. You know what I mean? That's... That's cool, you know what I mean? If you want the ego, you want that on your address, you know, this is where I live, and you tell her to go back. But go back to the neighborhood and tell the brother, this is where I live at, man, come see me. You know what I mean? Don't just say, well, this is where I want to be, and this is where I'm going to stay. I want to stay away. I want to meet the friends around the name. You know what I mean? Because that's not reality. That's not reality at all. And reality, you know, means a lot to me because I live it. I know who I am, and I know what I represent. And I'm happy with myself, you know what I mean? I'm happy with who I am. <laughs> provocative climax to a provocative look at Mike Tyson. HBO Sports prepares for the main event. Coming up, Mike Tyson's second assignment in the post-Tokyo era of his career against Alex Stewart, a man whose only professional loss was to the man who now holds the heavyweight championship, Evander Holyfield. And we bring you back live once again to ringside. I'm still joined by Spike Lee, and Spike, it was a fascinating piece. Now let me play devil's advocate with you right. on behalf of any of our, view our viewers who might be a little bit confused. Mike Tyson and Don King have achieved identity, money, fame, power, status, most of the things that we think of ourselves as striving for in this commercial society. Why are they so angry? Well, they think that they're getting the raw deal, that they haven't been betrayed. Uh correctly or truthfully in the press and I have to agree with them. I think that any time if you're when you're African-American in this country and you and achieve any level of success people just come after you I mean I know I'm I mean they're beating my they're beating my me now I mean they're, they're killing David Dinkins in New York since he's become mayor it's just it just happens I mean we realize this we realize why it happens so for me it just rolls off my back but I think that they've gotten a bum deal, Mike and Don. Don King says that there are no black heroes in this nation. Uh, at the risk of sounding a little bit tokenist, aren't people like Michael Jordan and Bill Cosby and to a large extent Spike Lee treated as heroes by this society? Well, I don't know if we'd be treated as heroes. I think that, that was a little exaggeration on his part. But when you, when you go into history books, I mean, we can't even get Martin Luther King's birthday, you know, in Arizona. So, I mean, that's a disgrace. So that's what he's talking about. I'm glad the commission NFL took the, took the Super Bowl out of Phoenix. What does Mike Tyson mean, above and beyond any other American boxer, to kids in the ghettos, in the inner city? Well, I think that for any ethnic group, any time that when you're on the bottom rung of the ladder and one of your own is able to squeeze out that little hole, it gives you hope. And I think that uh, that's what Mike Tyson has done with this. I, but I think the problem is that people get lulled into sleep. They think that because black Americans, because African Americans have Bill Cosby, Oprah Winfrey, Eddie, Eddie Murphy, we go on and on, that means everything's okay. Because, because we have Prince and Michael Jackson, that everything's all right for black Americans. But those are a couple of people. There's 30 million African Americans in the country, most of us, and most of us are catching hell. So we can't look at the one and two success stories, people being able to, to sneak through the cracks. Many thanks, and welcome to HBO. Thank you, Jim. Larry Merchant, what do you think of that? Boxing has seen snake oil salesmen of every size and shape and stripe and color, all with one consuming passion in life, to capture and then to keep money-making fighters. What Spike Lee showed us in part is that Don King does it by wrapping himself in the emotional flags of race and racial injustice. He has been pummeled, it should be pointed out, by black fighters like Larry Holmes and Buster Douglas and Tim Witherspoon, whom he promoted. Spike Lee also separated for us the Mike Tyson of past and the Mike Tyson of the present as a public figure. Mike Tyson used to be this troubled youngster who was saved from the streets and then nurtured and developed into a champion. Now Mike Tyson wants to tell us that you can get out of the kid can get out of the ghetto, but you can't get the ghetto out of the kid. And that's how he's going to recapture the heavyweight championship. And he just might do it. Finally, Spike Lee showed us that Mike Tyson throws as many bricks on the basketball court as he does in the ring. Here's a look at the man he's going to be throwing those bricks at tonight, Alex Stewart. Dawn, 
in the Catskills. Here the winter frost has yet to paint its inevitable chilling picture on this town's splendid canvas. And for one man who rises each and every morning to nature's silent sights and soothing sounds, this is a pensive time, a time to reflect on the opportunity that lies ahead. The only thing I really see is me beating Mike Tyson. It's just like a dream just keeps on coming. Just like climbing a mountain, you gotta walk you up to the top. And when you reach there, you're on top of the mountain. And I'm thinking Mike Tyson is the mountain. I have to climb all over. For Alex Stewart, the journey toward the top has been perilous. Despite his impressive record, many felt Stewart wasn't much more than a spoon-fed fighter. But that all changed the night he fought Evander Holyfield. After a brilliant performance in a losing cause, the English-born Jamaican was finally able to silence the skeptics. The Holyfield loss earned Stewart the respect of the boxing community and a chance to climb into the ring with Mike Tyson, one step closer to a shot at the heavyweight title. But first, tragedy would knock on Stewart's door. Just three months prior to the scheduled date with Tyson in September, Alex suffered a personal loss when Mike Jones, his co-manager and close friend, died unexpectedly from cancer. Jones's death would act as an added incentive for the young heavyweight, who would set out to prove that his manager's dreams weren't in vain. Mike Jones is always going to live on with me, regardless, win, lose, draw, whatever. He's always be with me. The only way they remember him is true my performance and how he's worked to get me this far. And I think um, everybody has worked to get me where I am. But I think the rest of my team are here, and he's not here. And I think this will give him plenty of joy just to know that I did all I could do. For his late manager, he would push his body to the limit. In training for Tyson, Stewart felt he had never been more focused and diligent. That was until two weeks before the fight, the night he got the news that Tyson had suffered a severe cut over his eye. The cancellation was a crushing blow to Stewart and his camp. It hurts in a way we, we can't explain. Here I was psyched up mentally and physically to fight this little guy. And here I am getting ready. And all of a sudden he gets caught. You know, I'm just about a week before I'm ready to leave for Lang City. Do the last two weeks of my training. I'm prepared the technique and everything I want to do. And all of a sudden, it's changed. He was totally devastated. When I walked into his room, uh, he sat there and wept and sobbed for quite a substantial period of time. It's as if you were trying to climb a mountain and you were the summit was in view, and you had to withdraw. In time, that frustration would subside. Realizing that life is too short and opportunities are oh so fleeting, Stewart forced himself into the gym and refocused on the one man who stood in his way. Alex Stewart believed he had worked too hard, sacrificed too much, come too far to accept anything less than victory. Everybody thinks that this is like two, three years of my fighting career. You know, I think of it oh, since I've been nine, you know, I've been fighting. And right now, only one person standing in my way. I mean, this will put me what I've been working for since I was a little kid. I mean, this is what I've dreamt about, being in a major fight where the opponent is just as good. And you just have to have that little edge. Like all worthwhile pursuits, boxing offers its practitioners no guarantee of success, only the chance to fulfill a dream. Tonight we'll see whether Alex Stewart's lifelong dream comes true as he searches for that little extra which he hopes will set him on a path toward a rematch with Evander Holyfield. We bring you back live, and we are ready now for Alex Stewart, a man who has lost only once in 27 professional fights, to leave his dressing room and make his way through this crowd to the ring. And that is Angela Stewart, his wife. She's at ringside. She will not stay at ringside. 
when Alex Stewart gets to the ring, he will throw her a kiss, and she will flee out the front door onto the boardwalk up to her hotel suite, where she will watch the fight on television, as has been her custom in the past. You saw Stewart's rankings, two of the governing bodies putting him up there at fourth, right up in the same neighborhood with Tyson and Holyfield and Razor Ruddock. All of his 26 wins by knockout. Indeed, Mike Tyson has fought two of the shortest bouts in heavyweight championship history here. Yeah. And here may be a fitting opponent because Alex Stewart has never gone farther than eight rounds, and 24 of his fights were four rounds or less. And he's and he sweated up nicely because he has a bit of a reputation of starting slowly, although he throws an awful lot of punches in early rounds. And again, as with the Douglas uh, in Tokyo, he's running to the ring to meet Mike Tyson. And you saw the nervous Angela Stewart, Alex's wife, as she prepared to try to make eye contact with her husband and then leave ringside. Five-year-old daughter, Tennille Stewart, is a little bit more resistant to the ravages of this experience than her mother. She stays to watch Dad fight. Although maybe not tonight. It's a little late for a five-year-old. There is Stewart's record. And one cautionary note, he has gotten his shot on the basis of a loss, however brave that loss was. Well, from rounds two through five in the bout against Holyfield, he was the superior fighter, landing more blows, throwing more blows, and generally dominating the action against Holyfield. Holyfield reversed the tempo in round six, took advantage of a cut over Stewart's eye, which had resulted from a second round headbutt, and progressively opened the cut to the point where the bout was stopped in round number eight. which means that here comes Mike Tyson. It's a tribute to Tyson, incidentally, that despite what happened in Tokyo, he has filled this building with about 16,000 people. Aren't many fighters out there who can do that? Certainly no non-champions. Indeed, Mike will tell you in no uncertain terms that he's still the main man in the heavyweight division where ticket sales are concerned. He suggests that Neither Holyfield nor Foreman, and certainly not Razor Ruddock, could ever dream of selling as many tickets or as many pay-per-view subscriptions for a fight as can he. Well, he's Mike likely Tyson. to be proven wrong on that when Holyfield does fight Foreman. But suffice to say, he is still a major attraction. Ringside seats here, incidentally, are just $400, a fraction of what they've been in the past for him. There are some consequences to losing. Tyson's last fight, two minutes and 47 seconds against Henry Tillman, the man who had beaten him twice back in the amateur ranks. In that mob surrounding Mike are all three of the trainers now enlisted in Team Tyson, Aaron Snowell, Richie Giacchetti, whom you'll remember from his long tour of duty with Larry Holmes, and Jay Bright. The three of them nestle just behind the fighter as they make their way toward the ring. Looks like a T-formation with a flanker, Jim. That's right. Mike's playing quarterback. Aaron and Richie are the halfbacks, and Jay Bright is dropping back as a fullback into a sort of short punt formation at this point. Now Mike will emerge into the ring where most of the crowd will get its first look at it. What he's wearing is a torn towel. And there you see the record. 38 wins, the one loss to Douglas in Tokyo. This is the 40th bout of Tyson's professional career. His knockout percentage with 34 KOs is high, but not the highest in the history of the sport. And there goes Angela. Tyson looks a little fitter. I like Mike Tyson when he, when he looks small, when he looks like a big middleweight or a light heavyweight. So let's take a look at the tail of the tape. And you can see that the big disparity there is in height. 
Stewart four inches taller than his opponent. He has an eight inch reach advantage. Tyson at 217 and three quarters looks to most observers here to be splendidly trained in terrific shape. And the punch that numbers, there you see what Tyson did against Douglas. But look what Stewart did against Holyfield. 81 punches around, an amazing number of punches for a heavyweight. Rules for the bout, New Jersey's rules. Three judges scoring the fight, 10 point must system. Standing eight count in effect. Three knockdown rule in effect. Neither fighter can be saved by the bell. So right now let's go up to the ring announcer, Michael Buffer, for the pre-fight introduction. Ladies and gentlemen, Don King Productions in association with the Trump Plaza Hotel and Casino here on the boardwalk in Atlantic City, New Jersey, present the featured bout of the evening. In attendance here at ringside tonight, ladies and gentlemen, our host, a man who's brought 50 championship bouts to Atlantic City in the last four years, Mr. Donald J. Trump. And in the ring at this time, the promoter for tonight's great event and many others through the years around the world, Mr. Don King. This bout is sanctioned by the New Jersey State Athletic Control Board. All the officials shall remain the same except the judges assigned at ringside. For this bout, they are John Stewart, Rocky Castellani, and Eugene Grant. And now, ladies and gentlemen, from the Trump Plaza Hotel and Casino on the boardwalk in Atlantic City, New Jersey, uh, let's get ready to rumble! Ten rounds of boxing in the heavyweight division. The referee for this bout is Frank Cappuccino. Introducing first, fighting out of the blue corner, wearing the black trunks with gold trim. He weighed in at an even 218 pounds. He's originally from England, but now lives and fights out of Brooklyn, New York. His professional record, an unbelievable one, 26 victories, all 26 by knockout, only one defeat. He's the number four ranked heavyweight in the world. Ladies and gentlemen, Alex the Destroyer Stewart. And fighting out of the red corner, wearing the solid black trunks, weighing 217 and three quarter pounds from Catskill, New York. Also an unbelievable record, 38 victories. 34 by KO, only one defeat. He's the number one ranked heavyweight in the world. Ladies and gentlemen, the former heavyweight champion of the world, Iron Mike Tyson. Good evening, gentlemen. We're both giving your instructions by the New Jersey Control Board. Protect yourself at all he, times. He like you, baby. Both, Both yeah. your sweats gloves. Come on, come on. Come on, baby. That's come right, on. baby. The come question, on, baby. as in all Tyson fights, can the opponent maintain his poise in the face of Tyson's quickness and menace? Or will he retreat stay in corner, Alex. into self-defense? Stay, stay in the corner, Michael. Stewart okay. has stated categorically that he knows he needs to keep throwing punches to try to keep Tyson occupied. If he stops throwing, he'll be dead. Tyson lands a right and another. This could be quick. I was afraid of a 30-second sound bite. All right, man. Okay, let's go. Remember, Stewart never went down against Evander Holyfield. Shot to the body, another solid right hand. Stewart begins to throw as a means of trying to defend himself. That'll be called a slip. And Mike is a little wild as he goes for the kill. A good right hand that hurts Stewart again, but Stewart is still upright. was a flush right hand. Four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. He's up just at the count of nine, Jim. How you feel, man? Taking a good look at Cappuccino. He's going to let him go. Three knockdown rule is in effect.
effect. But Stewart goes down again. It's over. And Stewart has quick throwing punches. You can see how wobbly his legs are. He makes it through a minute and 20. It'll be a small miracle. Let him go, let him go, come on. Stop punching. That was a worthwhile grab. Tyson missed with a left that would have done it. He's very calculating now, Tyson. Two more right hands land. Stewart must land something or else it's just a question of a few seconds. That'll do it. Two, three, four, five, six, seven, They're forgetting that the three knockdown rule is in effect. This fight is over. Well, Stewart said that Tyson was a mountain. He had a climb. He just got knocked off that mountain. He just didn't have the style, Jim, unlike Douglas, to test the vulnerability of Tyson. Yeah, he's not nearly the technician that Douglas was when Douglas was good. In yeah, Tokyo. early in the fight, Douglas tied Tyson up. He used his jab. He survived and then let and, and determined the pace of the fight. Nothing about him. All right, you stay right there for a moment. Let me take a look here. I got caught in the early part. The first fight, first punch. You know how many times you got knocked down? Three times. Three times. The first time, right? Yeah. You remember the first one? Yeah. Yep. Okay. Now, do you think you can stand up now? Yeah. Just stand up for me. Put your feet together as you stand up. Put your feet together. Right. Hold me. No, I'm just holding you to see if you can afford it. Put your feet together. As you. Let him go. Let him go. Let him go. the first of the three knockdowns you look at Tyson moving in with controlled fury and the right hand puts Stewart down Stewart was able to get up at the count of five now we'll take a look is this the first knockdown again yes it is another angle the winner the right hand to the top of the head was the one that put Alex down that knockdown occurred within the first 10 seconds of the round Now we'll take a look at knockdown number two. By this time, Stewart still wobbly from the first knockdown, and he went down without Mike having to land a crushing blow. Another look at knockdown number two. And you can see that the right hand simply glanced off the top of Stewart's head, but it was enough to put down a very wobbly fighter at that point. And now here's a third look at that same knockdown, knockdown number two. The left to set it up, the glancing right off the top of the head. And Stewart down for the second time in the round. Still more than a minute 40 seconds remained in the round at that point. And with the three knockdown rule in effect, it was up to Stewart to try to stay on his feet to make it through round number one. He was not able to do it. Here's knockdown number three, which came at two minutes, 27 seconds of the first round. A right and a left, and that was enough for Alex Stewart. Referee Frank Cappuccino began the count, which was academic at that point because of the three knockdown rule. Another look at the third knockdown, solid left to the side of the head, but by that time, it was the accumulation of punishment throughout the round, which contributed to Stewart's demise. So Mike Tyson, in his three fights in this particular ring, his last three fights, I should say, in this particular ring, has a 91-second knockout, a 93-second knockout, and this one, 147 seconds. Three first-down knockouts in his last three appearances here in Atlantic City for Tyson. Punch stat statistics for the one round in the fight. Tyson threw 46 and landed 21. Stewart, given credit for having landed four punches, he stopped punching somewhere early in the second minute of the round. 
and simply tried to survive from that point on with the by now obvious result. So this crowd remains on its feet. Almost everyone still here in the arena as they await the official announcement. And we wait to see if we'll... Well, they've gotten the official announcement. I was looking at replays, and I'm told now that the official announcement has already been made by Michael Buffer. And we wait now to see if we'll get a chance to talk with Mike Tyson about this, the 39th victory of his professional career. Mike Tyson to join us now at ringside. Congratulations on victory number 39. You came out with fury, to say the least. Knocked him down in the first 10 seconds of the round. If I can get you to turn toward the camera a little bit, Mike. How important was it to you to score a first round knockout tonight? Well, I mean, I knew he was a dangerous fighter once he got warmed up. And my objective, I was in great shape. He was to go in there and put the pressure on him for 10 rounds. I knew I had to break him eventually. You appear to be in sensational condition. Do you feel considerably differently now than was the case 10 months ago in Tokyo? Absolutely, because my mind is more prepared. You know, I mean, that's what basically the whole standpoint came down to, being um, prepared mentally. How does your situation compare now to what most people would regard as the peak of your career when you knocked Spinks out here in 91 seconds? Well, you know what I mean? I didn't, I didn't feel like it was a sustained shoot of night tonight because there are things that I know that I did that were mistakes. So, you know what I mean? A good fight, and I'm in good shape. Now, I just like to thank all my fans on HBO that's been supporting me. But I just like to say this is my last fight on HBO. It's because HBO, they think that you'd rather see Holofield than me. Thank you for supporting me. I love you all. Bye. Mike, one final question. How important at this moment is the coming arbitration with regard to the WBC championship and the possible WBC title fight with Ruddick? Well, it really don't matter, as long as I can fight for the title. I, I, love, I love to fight Ruddick. I want to show everybody he's not the baddest man in the world they once said he is. Would you rather fight the winner of Foreman Holyfield? Excuse me? Would you rather fight the winner of Foreman Holyfield? I would fight anyone. You know what I mean? But I'm, I'm, I'm fighting for the moment. It looks like Ruddick might be in the, in the wings, and I'm looking forward to fighting Ruddick. Can you elaborate on why you feel you've been treated unfairly by this network, which will state that it has two offers on the table for you for long-term deals? I have no comment. I don't want to talk about no. the, the, the company know what they did, and I'd like to say hello to all my troops again that have been supporting me. I'm out of here. We've enjoyed covering you. Thank you very much. We don't negotiate on the air. Our chief executive, Seth Abraham, will have plenty to say in the future about the potential for another Mike Tyson deal at HBO. It has been our hope for the past year that we could complete one more deal to give a long-term contract to Mike Tyson and to continue, his cover, or to continue to cover his fights here on HBO. But there'll be no negotiation on the air. That will take place between Don King and Seth Abraham. We're grateful that Mike was willing tonight to come and speak to us at ringside in the midst of what is, quite candidly, a frosty period between us and him and his promoter, Don King. So Mike Tyson has the 39th victory of his career, the 19th first round knockout of his career. And this is a look at the quickest KOs of Tyson's career. Of course, there was the 32nd destruction of Marvis Frazier in upstate New York. And the rest of those first round destructions against journeyman fighters going on toward the 91 second knockout of Spinks and the 93 second knockout of Carl the Truth Williams. Once again, there have been 19 first-round knockouts among Mike Tyson's 39 career victories. And he takes another step toward reestablishing the kind of preeminence he enjoyed in the heavyweight division prior to the Buster Douglas upset in Tokyo 10 months ago. So as we look back once again, we'll take another observance of the last two knockdowns which Five, led to this three-knockdown rule, first-round knockout eight, for Mike Tyson. Nine. Alex, the destroyed feel, Stewart, okay. has the second you? loss of his career. And Tyson puts himself in good company 
as both of Stewart's losses have come against heavyweight champions. One to Evander Holyfield, and now this one to Mike Tyson. Of course, Holyfield was not champion at the time at which he beat Stewart 13 months ago. Here was the finishing touch. Solid left hook there. Tyson landed several blows in the round which appeared more effective than the ones which contributed directly to knockdowns. So you have to believe it was the accumulation of punishment throughout the round which was ultimately decisive in the fight. Crowd was on its feet throughout the round from the moment that Tyson put Stewart on the canvas in the first 10 seconds. Before Six, academic, seven, eight, as at this moment, by it. virtue of the three knockdown rule, it was over. So Tyson continues to celebrate, and we go into the ring as Larry Merchant has Alex Stewart. Alex, you've had a chance to watch those knockdowns. You describe what happened. Just got caught early, that's all. Were you stunned from that first? Knocked down. Did you ever recover during the round? This caught me. That's all. It's one of those things. You get caught early. It's, you know, that's what happened. What didn't you do that you wanted to do? Well, what I wanted to do is move around a lot more and hit more on target, but see, I missed a lot. What is it like in there with this Tyson who seems very quick and even skillful in the bombs he's throwing? Just, just I didn't get off. That's all. Just didn't get off. That's all. Thank you very much, Alex. Thank you. Jim? All right, thank you very much, Larry. Well, you've often heard Larry Merchant describe boxing here on HBO as the theater of the unexpected. Tonight, it was theater of the expected, as the two great fighters on the card, Julio Cesar Chavez and Mike Tyson, both scored easy, early knockout victories to continue to enhance their credentials. Chavez as he moves back toward a rematch with Meldrick Taylor, a reprise of maybe the greatest competitive battle of 1990. Tyson, as he tries to move back toward his heavyweight title, the way he sees it, the one he lost in Tokyo 10 months ago. The future unclear for Mike at this point. Maybe he waits for the winner of Holyfield versus Foreman. Maybe he goes on to a bout with Razor Ruddock. Maybe there will be another opponent in between as he waits for the Foreman Holyfield winner. Right now, we get ready to look back at what happened this evening. A final look at both of these battles. Julio Cesar Chavez defeating Kundukan with a third round technical knockout. Chavez had knocked on down twice previously in the bout before putting him away in round number three. And as you can see, it was in effect a retirement as on decided he had had quite enough. And then Mike Tyson defeated Alex Stewart with a first round TKO. Based on the three knockdown rule, Tyson knocking Stewart down in the first 10 seconds of the fight and going on to put him down twice more en route to his third consecutive first round knockout in this particular building. And I'm rejoined at ringside by Larry Merchant who gets a chance for his final comments on this evening. Larry? Well, we used to describe Mike Tyson as a sort of force of nature, like a storm. Uh, but even storms blow out to sea and lose their force, and then they regroup and they become storms again, and maybe that's what's happening with, with Mike Tyson. Perhaps he's the sort of personality who will, be, who will drive harder and stay in better shape when he's pursuing the title than when he has the title. But we still have to wait for him to fight a more meaningful opponent, someone who has even more skills to try to frustrate him or more power to make him think twice before he charges in as recklessly as he did. But for tonight, Mike Tyson did what he wanted to do. He wanted to look impressive. He wanted to beat Stewart in a much more decisive, explosive, exciting fashion than the current champion Evander Holyfield did. And for him, it doesn't get much better. And maybe the next fight will be against Roddick. We should mention, incidentally, that on the undercard here this evening, Razor Roddick scored a first-round knockout of his own 
over a journeyman fighter named Mike Rouse. Stay tuned to see what happens next in the heavyweight division. We'll see you next on January 19 from this same arena when WBA World Welterweight titleist Aaron Davis defends that title against Meldrick Taylor moving up in class. Coming up on HBO, be sure to stay tuned immediately following this boxing coverage for a special presentation of The Edge, Professional Man, followed by Dirty Harry on the East Coast and Batman on the West Coast. All of those programs to be seen in their entirety. And we remind you to tune in each week for Inside the NFL. Hosts Len Dawson, Nick Buonaconte, and Chris Collinsworth take you right through Super Bowl 25 with pro football's most informative hour, premiering every Wednesday at 7 p.m. Eastern time right here on HBO. So now for Larry Merchant, I'm Jim Lampley saying so long from Atlantic City, New Jersey. The executive producer of HBO Sports and producer of tonight's telecast was Ross Greenberg. Tonight's doubleheader directed by Mark Payton. The feature producers, Spike Lee and Michael Whelan. Associate producer, or associate director, I should say, Dave Harmon. Assistant to the producers, Kendall Reed and Kirby Bradley. Production manager, Russell Gabay. The technical supervisor was George Wenzel. And the technical director was David Massa. of HBO Sports, the network of champions.